to you, what is a cryptocurrency? Okay, the well, the, the crypto part of the word, it refers to cryptography, obviously, but that's in direct contrast to a, a government fiat currency. So when you have the US dollar or British pound or euro, you basically, at the end of the day, if you boil it all down, you have a, an, an account with the government. You may have an account with a bank, but that bank has an account with the central bank, which is run by the government. So really, at the end of the day, you have a, an account with the government. That's your fiat, tr your traditional government currency. And this is in direct contrast to that, where you have a, basically an account that is calculated by a software algorithm. And so the, the big implication of that is that the software algorithm, it doesn't have any idea if you if you are physically located in any individual country or breaking any laws or doing anything politically subversive. It doesn't know if you're white, black, male or female, four years old, you know, if you're not even a person at all and you're just a computer following instructions. So, so that's the big practical uh, distinction. Hmm. So where did you first come across the idea of, of a, a digital cryptocurrency? Like when did it first like cross your, uh, your radar? Yeah. Well, I, it's funny because people had been telling me about it for a while and I always thought this is the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> uh, it's, and in fact, the story I often tell, which is the hundred percent, the truth is that there was this free state project where a bunch of people in America were, were going to move to the state of New Hampshire and then politically organize to become more active there. And they were sending out emails about coordinating this big project. And I'd signed up for the, the email list. And one of them was like, if you, if you come, we'll give you free Bitcoin. It was like 50 free Bitcoin or something. If you go, <laughs> this is like in 2010 or something a long oh. time ago. And I, I literally was so angry. I was like, these stupid libertarians, you know, um, you can't run money like this. You can't just start a new one up because network effects and because, you know, it's a victim of its own success. If, if it succeeded, someone else would, there would be copycats. And, and so I actually, I remember distinctly, something like that, that email stood out as being annoying and I unsubscribed from the mailing list either immediately afterwards or sometime after. I was like, this is just so stupid. I can't believe I ever like threw in with these jokers. Uh, but what really changed my mind completely about it was the, um, there was an article about Silk Road. I think it was in... Um, it was in Gawker, maybe, or Wired, I don't remember. But there was an article about Silk Road, and it was basically, it, it just explained a couple things. One was that these people need, they absolutely needed Bitcoin to complete the transaction. They couldn't use a credit card, it would have their real name on it. They couldn't use like a check. They couldn't use cash, because you'd have to just mail the cash to someone or whatever. And then, you know, that's not a great idea. Um, and so they absolutely had to use Bitcoin to do the transaction. But what also struck me as interesting about it was that a bunch of crazy drug dealers and drug addicted people, they were already, they had gotten it to work, you know, like it was a complicated technology, but they, it worked well. It was like user-friendly enough to be used. And that really caught me by surprise. I was like, huh? Cause you know, I, you thought about it as this complicated thing, but then you're like, oh, random guy down the street i mean the joke's on you right random guy down the street is like is already using this and silk road was doing enormous amounts of revenue and was it was enormously profitable so just objectively the economic value was there and so i thought well this is going to be for every illegal transaction in the world um this and but it can also be used for every legal transaction in the world and and the illegal illegal distinction you know what, a certain time and place, like slavery was once legal in the United States. And in fact, I'm in Connecticut right now. There used to be a law that said if someone came up from the South and just pointed at someone and said, that person escaped from my slave plantation in the South, you had to help capture them and return them to the South, or you could be fined an enormous amount of money and sent to jail for the Fugitive Slave Act. Right. So, so that was a law at a different time. And, you know, and all around the world, we have different governments who you know, governments are just not perfect. They're, and societies figure out what the law is over time. The law is, is growing and changing and improving all the time, which means that it, at every stage in its evolution, it has flaws that need to be fixed. But it also includes all kinds of stuff like just trying to get your money out of, 
out of uh, China and escape the country with your life or something or um, anything in, you know, what are you going to do if you're female and you're in Saudi Arabia or something, you know, what, what are you going to do if you're in a country with hyperinflation? So this whole legal, illegal thing, everyone likes to, of course, pretend like they would never, ever, ever, ever be associated with anything legal and <laughs> And uh, they wouldn't go out with someone who would and blah, blah, blah. And we, so it's like, we want to avoid this thing. But deep down, we all know that, you know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of tax laws that no one obeys. There's speeding on the, on the highway. There's a lot of, you know, these city ordinances about when you can mow your lawn, blah, blah, blah. So, so I was just kind of like, oh, wow, this thing is like taken off. Like I thought, I, I thought it was so dumb. It's actually so practical. And people are already using it. And I just thought what's, what's, what's missing is that everyone else is thinking as I thought before when I got the, the email, I was like, this is some scam or some stupid thing. That's, that's the mistake. They don't realize that it's already, the project is already like completed. They're already, already being used in commerce. Mm, yeah, like the, the, the idea has already reached its conception. It's not like they're still figuring out how, how to work it. Like it, it's more about integration now than it is about um, like figuring out how the technology itself works. Yeah, but, the, the cool thing I want to mention about the, the, the drug dealer thing, it was kind of important because you would think the drug dealer is already criminal. So if they could steal the money, they would. Yeah. Because they've got nothing. But And also the drug addicts, they really want the drugs. So if they could game the thing and spend the same money twice or something to get more drugs, they would. So you had the situation where actually really, really like selfish people who had nothing to lose, it was working for them. And so I was like, oh man, like, you know, that was what made me think, oh, the project is already finished. Mm. So you're saying if, if, if there was an opportunity to exploit it for fraud or it was the way to, if there was a way to scam people specifically by like attempting to make them make transactions in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin in this case, but like in any other cryptocurrency, that it would be, that they would have already done it. Like that that would have been the, 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 the first breeding ground for it would have already resulted in, in loads of scams, but instead it, it worked. And that's for you, one of the remarkable parts of it. Yes, yeah, so it was very stress test, stress tested. I think everyone wanted this transaction to fail, the buyer, the seller, the government. <laughs> Like, but it would still, it would still go through. And I, so that's what made me really think, oh, I had really misunderstood it. And I was like, oh, I have to look into this more. Yeah. And then you look into it more and you, um, you learn a lot more about your own. Like I, at first I was like, why don't they just use credit cards on this site? And then you're like, oh, you know, of course, because your name and your address is on there, but it's more than that. It's like, you know, you call up the credit card company and just say you didn't buy something and you lost the card. They may always make the merchant eat it. So there's like this entire world that you don't see if you're like a just merely a consumer or even just like an upper middle class type white guy. You just sail through life and you just think, oh, like a cash, a check, a credit card, a debit card are all like equivalent to you. But then you start to dig into this and you're like, oh, no. there's all these big differences. Mm. I mean, I guess the speed um, of which it can be it can be done is also a uh a bonus especially if you're talking about transferring money around the world but like the the big question i want to i want to kind of ask here um at the start i say at the start we've been talking for a while but anyway is that um there up until the the 1970s in america and i'm not actually sure when we came off the gold standard in britain but essentially the 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 money in america the dollar uh, was backed by by gold up until the se- the 1970s i think it was 70 70- 172 uh, it got removed um and so you it was no longer backed by something physical it was just based on each individual's trust in the dollar like that the dollar will still be worth one dollar in a, in one week one month one year that okay save for a small inflation like it's it's a it's a safe place for your money to be in the dollar it's not going to it's not going to get hyperinflated out of existence uh, it's not going to just no. People are going to continue to take it. It's all based on our our confidence in the fact that the price will remain the same. So, what is the the difference here between Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency now and 
um, how we how we now operate the financial system, where our our currency may be like the central issued currency of a government, but it's not actually backed by anything physical. What's the difference here between that and Bitcoin, aside from the obvious, like the fact it's digital? Yeah, well, I mean, the U.S. dollar and most currencies are almost completely digital already. And in fact, all currencies are really abstract if you kind of think about it. But even like, you know, the cash in your wallet is really like a physical coupon for the digital account at the commercial bank. Commercial bank has an account at the, the central bank. Um, I think, well, obviously, if I could try to answer your question, I mean, both of them are really backed by nothing and they're really both digital. Uh, that, or the, which is to say they're backed by the community that would accept them. Um, and the question is, why would someone accept something for the first time if no one else is accepting it? But that turned out to have, in Bitcoin's case and in fiat currency's case, that had turned out to have an answer, uh, um, which is that people would, you had a reason to believe that people would accept it in the future. Um, so I could get more into that if you like, but let me see if I can try to drive it exactly with your, what is exactly your, your question is, how is it, I mean, the, as I said, one is run completely by software algorithm and the other is not. And so the other is run by people. And so when you have people involved, you have a lot of advantages. People can use reason. They can just get out of a bad rule that they don't like. They can just, you know, in an emergency, they can just drop the rule if they don't like it. Um, but there's also a lot of disadvantages because you have basically corruption. You know, how do you know that the people are running it in the best interests of the users of the currency and not in their own interest or in some someone else, some, some politician's interest. You, you really don't unless you, unless you join the team and work for 30 years and become, try to learn everything about what they're doing. It would be very difficult for you to even tell whether or not they are corrupt. Uh, but in the case of cryptocurrency, is there's just this algorithm. And a lot of people have, the algorithm itself has been, it could be in many ways, but the ways that this Bitcoin is, for example, they've made choices that are like the fix, the 21 million coin limit, the fixed supply. They say, we will only create so many units. And this is now hard coded into the software. So it's a very hard limit. You know, it won't, it won't be changed by any person. And so then when people say, well, what do I want to, you know, I have some savings. Do I want to hold it in US dollar, uh, which can be, uh, you know, of which an infinite amount can be created tomorrow and which trillions is being created um, as we speak, uh, or do I want to hold it in Bitcoin where I know that this is the exact schedule? Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. Get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War. And most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.